you ready? I mean, not you. <laughs> okay, John, are we ready? Well, okay, so um, <clears throat> as the Rav mentioned, uh, we thank Jonathan uh, for uh, arranging the, the, the class here and Bershut the Mora da Asra, Shlita. Um, the truth is, is, we wanted to introduce the, the uh, Kahal to a little bit, to a concept that we've been working in North Miami Beach, the Colo North Miami Beach, together with there's a, a, a local law firm, Stockhan Raverman, um, to bring awareness of Inyanim of Chosh Mishpat, of business halacha and how to run one's business according to halacha to the community at large. And um, Dayan Zimmerman has come before and come again as an expert Dayan and uh, just a wonderful person and Rav and role model to expand on this topic and teach us about it. Um, in addition, we would like to just dedicate the Shir Lila Nishmas Peretz Ben Alter Eliezer, who was a, uh, actually an attorney in that law firm and um, was nifted within the last 30 days. And uh, we want the, uh, the Shir to be Lila Nishmas. So um, if anyone wants to learn more about um, this initiative, this concept in general, there's a little bit of material in the back, but without further ado, with the Roshos of the Rav, I'd like to call on the Dayan. Shus Rav Shlita Chala Mesubim Khan. Today's cheer is titled Behind the Dian's Gavel. And first I'd like to introduce myself, but to show that this is authentic, I brought along my gavel. Whenever things get out of hand in the Bedin, we have a gavel. I don't think I'll need it tonight, but I just wanted to show that, that it's real. Now, just to explain a bit how we operate, in the United States, where I come from, sorry if anyone want, was expecting an English accent because they find it exotic, but I happen to have grown up in Brooklyn. And, but I, I've been in England now for 16 years, in the United States, largely, you have synagogues, schools that are independent. Each one is independent one of another. In Europe, to a very large degree, you have schools, synagogues, and they are part of a larger kehillah. For example, in London, there are four large kehillot. There is the United Synagogue, Federation of Synagogues, Union of Orthodox Hebrew Congregations, and the Spanish and Portuguese Kehillah. And shuls affiliate themselves with an umbrella organization called the Kehillah. For example, I am employed by the Federation of Synagogues. There are 40 Batek Nisiyot. These 40 unite under the umbrella of the umbrella organization, which is called the Federation. In that capacity, I serve as the Rav and the Av Bezden of the Federation. When I say Rav, I don't have a shul myself. But I serve as the Rav of all the Rabbanim. There are the 40 shuls, they have 40 Rabbanim, and I am the Rav of the Rabbanim, but I don't deal with people, only with Rabbanim. Someone said, how do you know that a Rav is not Jewish? He says, because you, we say in, in, in Kaddish, Al Yisrael v'al Rabbanon. So it seems that it's just two separate things. I don't deal with Yisraels, I only deal with Rabbanon. Also in that capacity, I serve as the head of the Bet Din, 
when people have cases within the organization or even people from the outside, they then come to a bestin. And in that capacity, I oversee various functions. There is the Betin for Chosh and Mishpat, where people have financial cases. There's one, we have Gitin and Kiddushin. Usually on Mondays and Thursdays, we have financial cases. On Wednesdays, I do Gitin and authorized marriages. On Tuesdays, we oversee Kashrut and the Hebra Kedisha and advise other Rabban. So that is the structure that we work with. And in that, within that structure, I had the, the best in. Now, a person's a businessman. They think, how many halachas do I need to know? Business is business. But you should know, they tell a story that there once was a person who was a sheikhet. And his responsibility was to slaughter animals for the kila, And he felt, you know, it's too much responsibility. You know, when you shecht, you have to be very meticulous. And he decided, you know what? Instead of being a sheikh, I'm going to go into business. But before he did so, he decided he's going to ask advice from Abisrol Salanta, the founder of the Musa movement. And Bissol Salanta says, I don't understand you. If you learn Yeradeya, how many simanim in Yeradeya are Helcha Shechita? There's 28. How many simanim in Cheshem Mishpat are there about business? It's about approximately 430. He says, I don't understand you. You're too worried about the responsibility of fulfilling 28 simanim, so you're going to go into something that is 430 simanim. And if we have to recognize, if you run a business or you work for a business, one has a responsibility to adhere to halacha. Now what I'd like to do tonight is just describe various cases that we're dealing with. And from this you'll learn what not to do. Because to teach you what yes to do is 430 simanim. The Rav gracefully, graciously said, I can speak for two, three hours tonight, but he didn't mean two, three years, just two, three hours. And don't worry, he'll, he'll be out within an hour. But, um, but I could teach you what not to do, and that's very important. Now, first let me explain how one gets to a, di- a dinter. <clears throat> Let's say you have two people, we'll call them Reuven and Shimon, and they have a dispute. Reuven feels that Shimon harmed him in some way. So he calls him to a din Torah, which means he goes to the Bet Din, speaks to the registrar, called the Safra the Daina, and says, can you send a Hasmana, a summons, to that person? I have a claim against him. He is the claimant. The Bezdin then sends a summons to the respondent. To the person the claimant wants to call to a din ter. The halacha is halach achar hanitva. Who gets to choose the venue? Who gets to choose which bezdin to go to? Although every din is initiated by the toveya, he's the one who wants something, he's the claimant, but ultimately, it's the respondent who gets to choose the venue. And therefore, the first step is establishing an agreement on a venue. The Tovea wants one, din, one venue, the Nitva wants a different men venue, it's the Nitva that gets the choice. Once they have agreed upon a venue, or the Nitva has chosen it, the next step is call them in for a a date you set a date and you have them sign a arbitration contract what we call shtare birurin I happen to bring one along and basically in a arbitration contract both sides agree that they are going to submit this dispute 
to this tribunal, in this case, the Besden of the Federation of Synagogues. What, what is accomplished by signing the Shtari Barur? <clears throat> What's accomplished is that after we hear the Holden Torah and we give out a psak, it is now enforceable in a civil court also. So let's say we say, Reuven is chayef to Shimon, or Shimon's chayef to Reuven, 100,000 pounds. And we have cases that are on many millions of pounds. And Shimon says, I don't want to pay. Well, the Bet Din today doesn't have the enforcement powers that it had in the olden days in Morocco. But you should know, it's then, since the person signed an arbitration contract, it then is, goes straight to court, and the court will always enforce it. And that's why you have everyone sign an arbitration contract. And also in the arbitration contract, sometimes it will say the terms of engagement. It will say how much people will pay for it. It will say what happens if one of the Dayanim becomes unwell. Who gets to replace him? Who gets to choose them? And it creates the terms of engagement. So step number one, is you have to define which bet then the respondent gets to choose it and they have to sign up to it. What happens if they don't come or they don't sign up? They'll say, we're coming, but we're not going to sign an arbitration contract. I want to hear what the Torah has to say, but I don't want to sign an arbitration contract. Now, all of us understand that means that if I win, I'm very happy with it in Torah, and if I'm going to lose, I'm going to ignore it. So instantly we recognize that this is what we call a person who is Misar of Ladin. He refuses to come to a Din Torah. Whether he refuses physically to come, or he comes and he doesn't cooperate, it's exactly the same. And again, in times of old, you used to put a person in Kherim, an excommunication. It's illegal in England and in many states in the United States to put a person in Kherim. As a matter of fact, in England, it's illegal because it's considered contempt of court. Because you're putting, ex excommunicating someone for, for not going to a bet din. Well, there's a court over there. So that itself is, puts you in contempt of court, and the dying himself can go to jail for 30 days for doing such a thing. So what do we do? We write a note that this person is not an adherent of din, which its laws are found in Yeridea Sim and Shin Lamadalit. In other words, if you want to know how to deal with him, look it up over there. We're not telling you what to do because we don't want to be in contempt of court. But we could tell you that this is the how you classify this Jew and look up his halachas in Yeridea Sim Lamadalit. And at the same time, we give the claimant the right to go to a civil court. Because although you're not supposed to judge, Two Jews are now supposed to judge a case in civil court. But if the person refuses to come to a bed then the bed then gives him permission to go to court and then they can adjudicate it in court. Baruch The next question comes up as follows. They've signed up in a, in a bet din. But you know, many times, not many times, but sometimes Jewish law and civil law have different rulings. For example, let's say in Jewish law, Grama ben Ezekin, if you indirectly <coughs> cause damages, it's not collectible in a Jewish court. But in civil law, it is collectible. It makes no difference if it's direct or indirect. And there are many, many such situations. Which body of law does one do use? And the answer is as follows. If it's a case of two people that have no contractual connection one with another, so then one uses Jewish law. If, however, they have a contractual connection with each other, sometimes in the contract itself, it says that any dispute will be adjudicated by the laws of England and Wales, or by the laws of the state of Florida. 
Now, although you're not allowed to go to a civil court, but they agreed with themselves that this will be, in the terms of the contract will be interpreted by the laws of the state of Florida, or it will be adjudicated according to the laws of the state of Florida. So you have to know that even though it's going to a Besden, the Besden will then have to adjudicate it in accordance to the laws that were agreed upon in the contract. Now, how do we do that if we are Dayanim and we learned Chesh Mishpat, we didn't learn the laws of English and Wales, of England and Wales, or the state of Florida? The answer is every Besden has a expert which they consult who will be able to inform them in this matter. Now there's a different question. Let's say there's no contract saying it. So we, we use Jewish law. But one of the Jewish laws are Dina de Malchusa Dina that the laws of the land, or the laws of the king, are binding. So how does that factor into a case where civil law and Jewish law diverge? And there's an answer as follows. There is a machlekes, the Ramah and the Shach. To what degree do you say, Dina de Malchus Dina? Everyone agrees in the absence of Jewish law. If you have a circumstance which Jewish law does not address, then you follow civil law. What happens if there's a conflict between civil law and Jewish law in matters of finances? Do we still say Dina de Malchus Dina and it overrides Jewish law or not? And there's an interesting machlekes. The Ramah gives very wide latitude to Dina de Malchus Dina, and he says that in any interaction between two people who live in a country by virtue of living in that country, they agreed, and there's an implicit agreement amongst themselves to operate in accordance to the laws of that country. And therefore, he says, any laws that are made for the benefit of the citizens of that country is binding, even in Allah. The Shach says no. The Shach says, when civil law is in conflict with Jewish law, we don't say necessarily say Dina the Malchus Adina. However, sometimes, although we don't follow civil law as a matter of judgment, but the civil law becomes the Minig Hamadina, becomes the, the conduct, the common conduct of people. And when you learn Chesh Mishpat or you learn Say the Nazik, and you see many times there's a dispute. And the thing is, hakol keminik amedina. And therefore, although the civil law is not binding per se, however, that civil law forms the the the, the stam das of people, and this is the interpretation of their interaction. And I'll give you a few examples. Corporations. I lend money to a corporation. The owner of the corporation, he can be a 100% shareholder and the director, and the sole shareholder and the sole director, but he has no, no personal liability. That is something that is created by civil law. In Jewish law, there's no such thing as a corporation. So now what happens if I lend money to a corporation, they default on it, and, but the owner is still a wealthy person. Does he have to pay in Jewish law? You'll ask the Ramah, the Ramah will tell you, no, he doesn't have to pay because of Dina de Malchus Dina. Because civil law says he doesn't have to pay. The Allah is that even if you'll ask the Shach, who says that civil law doesn't override Jewish law, but he says that everyone knows that when you deal with a corporation, what it means in civil law. And since you know what it means in civil law, that was your agreement. That's an implicit agreement to follow, to follow it over here. And therefore that becomes the Minig Hamadina. And in Cheshem Mishpat, Minig Hamadina overrides Halacha. So therefore, albeit at times, there won't be Dina de Malchus Adina, but the Dina de Malchus will, will, will create the Minig Hamadina. Next thing is bankruptcy. Bankruptcy does not exist in Jewish law. You can't declare yourself bankrupt and absolve yourself from debts. It just doesn't exist. 
Nevertheless, it exists in civil law. And everyone knows that it exists. And therefore, even uh, Moshe Feinstein writes that even according to the Shach, that Dina de Malchus Dina doesn't override Jewish law, but this was the implicit understanding of the people, and therefore bankruptcy, at least in commercial situations, will be enforceable. Next is employment contracts. In Jewish law, the employment contract is exactly what it says in the contract. You'll work for this amount, for this amount of time. Civil law, especially if you live in a socialist place, have a lot of protections for employees. You're not allowed to fire someone without, you know, cause. If you do fire the person, you have to pay them severance pay. There are certain minimum wage. There are all types of employment law that exist out there. Now, according to the Ramah, these are binding in halacha because the din of Malchus becomes binding in halacha. Even according to the Shach, who says that it doesn't override Jewish law, but what will happen is that this was the implicit understanding between an employer and an employee. If you live in a place and this, this place has certain laws, everyone understands that this was the implicit agreement behind the contract and therefore it's enforceable. Therefore, where in fact is, is the difference between the Ramah and the Shach is when there is no agreement between two people. There's no contractual relationship. According to the Shach, Dina Malchus Dina only works when there's an agreement or an interaction between the two, so two parties, then you say it, the understanding was in, in civil law. But what happens if it's a one-sided situation? One person damaged another person, harmed another person, stole from the other person, found of other person's object. And there you can have different laws in Jewish law than in civil law. Here the Ramo would say you have to follow the civil law. Rishach would say you don't have to. What about Yerusha? Yerusha the Ramo specifically excludes. It's interesting to note that although the Ramo says that that a Jewish law, that um, civil law can override Jewish law, he specifically excludes Yerusha. Now, I'll go through a few cases that we're dealing with at the moment. I cannot tell you their names because that's illegal. But I can tell you the, the cases. One set of cases is, did the person you deal with have the legal authority to make the deal that they, made, they did with you? Give you two cases we're dealing with at the moment. Number one, a person made a partnership with three people. One of them served as the director of that corporation. He represented himself and two other shareholders. Somewhere along the way, the partner who was a director reconfigurated the partnership with the other partner without telling his fellow shareholders the people he represents. Now we have a mess. A partner dealt Mr. W felt in, dealt in good faith with Mr. L. Mr. L and he's been dealing together for years. Mr. L who has two other partners did not inform his partners of the agreement that he made with Mr. W. Now, the other two partners are saying that we should undo the agreement because this person misrepresented us or represented us without permission and did it to our detriment. That's case number one. This one is rather easy to answer because Mr. L Besides being a shareholder and a partner, he was also the director of the corporation. Who appointed him the director of the corporation? His partners. Well, a director of a corporation has a right to make decisions on behalf of the shareholders without consulting the shareholders. If the shareholders feel 
that he was negligent in his fiduciary responsibility to represent them, they can sue him personally. But they can't undo any deal he, he made because he was made director. Slightly more complicated, this is a case of K versus H, is as follows. K is our contractors, builders, they built. H represented a consortium of investors. And K was creating a development for H. K was aware that H is just representing at least three other people. All of them are shareholders. All of them are directors. However, the way it went was that H was representing his partners throughout the throughout the building. So far, so good. One day, the bill comes due. And so therefore, H, on behalf of his partners, has to pay. Well, H felt, on behalf of his partners, that there's better ways to invest the money than paying the contractor. Now, of course, everyone feels like that. But what happened was, H said, we will con I will convert this debt we have to you into a loan which pays interest via Heta Iske, the Tzrimut and Jewish law. And therefore, he agreed that this two million pounds we owe you, we're not going to pay you, we're going to give it, we're going to take it, we're going to hold it back as, as a loan and you're going to get a certain interest rate on it. Both sides agree on it. He didn't tell his partners about it. Now, it's a few years later, and the interest or the dividends have run up another 450,000 pounds. Mr. K says, pay up. H says, I don't have money. K says, it's not a problem because you're, you, you have properties and we're just going to take them away. Comes along the partners of H and says, you should know, we are all partners and we're all directors. But in our partnership agreement, it says that any director can make a deal on behalf of the corporation, but to take a loan, you need three out of four partners to agree. Business is one thing, loans is another thing. Or you want to sell the business, you need three out of four to agree. So once again, you're going to have a dispute. Did H, H clearly didn't have the right to take this loan because he didn't inform his co-directors and his co-shareholders. However, K, in good faith, dealt with him as he was dealing with him all along. And he had no reason to suspect that the same person he was dealing with, with all along, all of a sudden, does not have the authority to do what he's doing. But he didn't have the authority. What do you do? And the answer is, there's a Pisgah Tshuva that writes, and it, this exists in civil law too, there's a, there's a doctrine of presumed authority. In other words, if I put someone in a position of authority, even though I limited his authority, if the people dealing with him have the right to assume that he has authority, then I'm bound by what he does on my behalf, although I never authorized him to do it. This is what we call the doctrine of presumed authority. Well, in this case, H was representing his partners all the way through. K had a right to assume that he has a right to do the loan. Therefore, this loan is now binding on all of them, on the corporation which H represents. Again, the partners can then sue H for breaching their partnership agreement, but it doesn't undo the deal with K. Next, this is A versus T, they're both corporations. 
The corporation called T owns a piece of land. They don't have, it's valuable land, London land is very expensive. They do not have the resources with which to, um, to build. So they sell the land to A. But instead of doing a cash deal, they said, you know something? You can build 70 apartments on this land. Build 70. The first 50 are yours. In return for four and a half million pounds. And in addition, the next 20 that you build, from 50 to 70, you can also keep, but you have to pay us an overage of 140,000 pounds per apartment. And therefore, if in fact you build 70 apartments, A will have paid T 4.5 million pounds for the right to build and another 2.8 million pounds for the overage. What did A do? They built 50 apartments. They built 51 apartments. 50, which they kept themselves, one large apartment, maybe a two-story apartment, like a penthouse, and said, I have to pay you 140,000 pounds. Didn't say how large the apartments have to be. Didn't say per square foot the overage is X, or Y, or Z. All it said is that for every apartment over 50, we have to give you an overage of 140,000. Well, we only built one apartment over 140. T is screaming, what are you talking about? This was the deal. And you could build 70 apartments. You chose to build, build a big apartment. That doesn't take away our overage. And we want 2.8 million pounds. That winds, lend, lend, puts, winds you up in a dentera. But one says, side says, T says you owe me 2.8 million pounds. And... A says, I only owe you 140,000 pounds. That's going to make a dispute. Sometimes, you know, sometimes people fight over nothing. It's not worth it. Sometimes it is worth fighting. I don't know if it's worth it, but at least there's something to fight about. Now, interestingly enough, you cannot find anywhere in Chayish Mishpat this case. The question is, in Jewish law and civil law, largely it's exactly what it says in the contract. In Jewish law, you find out what was the understanding behind the contract. What were they thinking about when they made this agreement? Albeit the wording of this does not, does not necessarily say it directly. And although normally we dispose of, the, of Dine Teira in one or two sessions, I know sometimes in certain places, Dine Terra drag on and on. And unfortunately, it's because the Dayanim get paid by the session. We get paid a yearly salary, and the shorter it is, the less I work for the same amount of salary. So we get it done very, very quickly. This one took 15 sessions. We had to go through every contract, every communication, every email that was ever said over here to figure out what were they thinking when they made this agreement and after going through sometimes probably 600 pages of emails most of them totally irrelevant it was very very clear that this number of 4.5 million was arrived on a basis of valuating the, the, the apartments at the, value, at the size of 80, meter, 80 square meters each. And therefore, it follows that the 20, extra 20, were also supposed to be 80 meters each. Now, this person went and built one of 10,000 square meters, he's not going to get away with it, and he, had, and he ordered him to pay the 2.8 million which to their credit, they did. Sometimes people are very recalcitrant, and sometimes it's amazing. They had a Din Tera, one of the wealthiest people in England, from people in England, 
was called to the Torah, came to the Besden, and he argued his case, or he had his son argue his case on his behalf, and he felt he was right. After judging the case, we felt that he was wrong. We ordered him to write, to, to um, pay 550,000 pounds to his claimant. On the spot, he took out his checkbook, wrote a check for 550,000 pounds, which means he has quite a bit in this checking account. Gave the check, and on the way out, he said, I want you to know that I think you're wrong. You're misunderstanding the case. But I was raised by my parents that if a bezin tells me to do something, I do it. And if I wrote the check, but I want to tell you something more, which is very nice to hear. I'm a very wealthy, influential person, and no one crosses me. It's just not worth it. And I'm very impressed by your bezin, even though I think you're wrong, that you weren't scared of me at all, and you said I have to pay, and just handed over the check to the other person and just walked out. So sometimes you, you see something very nice. Next. The most painful DNA terror you deal with are family ones, family feuds. You know, there's an expression, no, no feud like a family feud. And it's interesting to note, I've done so many of them, about your rushes and, and all types of things. Almost always, there's an under, underlying emotional conflict that predates the financial conflict. conflict doing one between a brother and sister they're both well into their 70s both of them have enough money to live for their lifetime their children and their grandchildren's lifetime yet they're fighting over a certain property and you know I was wondering myself I mean I have to judge the case on its merits but why are you people fighting why two why is a brother and sister who are both wealthy fighting about something which is just a small fraction of, of their wealth. And they're arguing, they're arguing, and then all of a sudden it was the mother's Yerusha, the sister screams, 40 years ago when mom had a heart attack, you were too busy to go take care of her in Paris, and I was expecting a baby and I had to, tra I had to schlep there. And all of a sudden you see, it comes very clear, what they're fighting about. They're not fighting about the money. They're fighting about who was a better child. And I've heard seen this so many times over. I remember once two brothers fighting in a dentera, and all of a sudden one always screamed to the, at the other one, Dad always loved you more than he loved me. And therefore you have to know, sometimes you have to get to the underlying principle. We'll get back to more of that. Next case we're dealing with. Or, this is a common thing, we have many disputes, again, between contractors and investors and developers. Was the work done? Was the work done properly? Someone walks off the job in the middle because they feel they're not being paid. Did you have a right to walk off? Did you not have a right to walk off? How much was completed? Now, like I say, we are trained to learn Chayshim Mishpat, we are not trained to survey properties and figure out whether it was done properly or not or the like and the answer is the Besden appoints a, a surveyor a, a, a QS and says you act on behalf of the Besden to, to decide this thing what gives us the right to do so and who pays for it in the arbitration contract clause Number five, the parties hereby authorize the Beth Din to appoint experts or professionals to submit opinions which the Bezin feel are required for the case, including not limited to receivers administrators. The parties hereby commit to pay any fees in regard to that to the Bezin instructs. Payments of these fees must be made in advance. So therefore, when we sign people up, although they're coming to a Din Torah to be judged by Dayanim, they hereby agree that this case might require 
the appointment of outside professionals. The Bezin will choose that professional and they will have to pay it. And this happens over and over. Next, we'll take a different type of case. Someone does, A does work for B, unasked for. Does he have a, anybody benefited B? Does B, does he have a right to claim payment? I'll take one that I was just dealing with last week. A has an idea, he wants to make a, an event. He hires B, who's a performer, performing artist, to make this event. B tells A, there are two ways, two payment structures. Either you pay my fee, hire the sound equipment, everything, the lighting, everything, and then you get to keep the profits, or I'll do everything and I get to keep the profits. A, who was doing it as a public service, said, I'd rather have option B. You pay for everything and you get to keep the profits. That's the deal. Now, A needed help organizing this event, so he asked, hired a friend of his who is a event, org, event organizer to help him. At the end of the event, the, the friend, the event organizer, sends a bill to B, 500 pounds for their services. B says, I never hired you. A hired you, and I have a contract with A that I keep all the profits, and I never hired you. Now, it, seemingly, this is a simple open and shut case. It's true. B never hired A. B never hired the, the event organizer. A did. And therefore, if he has a claim, he should claim it against A, not against B. The event organizer doesn't want to claim it against A because he says A he was doing it not for profit. He was doing it for a chesed for the community. I don't want to make money of someone who was doing a chesed. So you should know in Jewish law, it's more complicated than that. There is a concept called nen, that if I do something that benefits you, and you were seeking to have this job done, although you didn't hire me, you still have to pay me for the lowest market rate for this job. And therefore, what it devolved into is, could B have done it without an event organizer? Then there's no obligation to pay. If the B can't do it without an event organizer, albeit he never hired a, the event organizer, that person is going to have to um, is going to have to pay. Now I'll take tell you a twist on this. The person who owns a hotel, a different person is a caterer. The caterer wanted to have the exclusive contract to cater at this hotel, cater events. So the hotel owner says help me set up the kitchen, and in return for that, I will pay you. I, you'll get an exclusive. The caterer, who happens to be from a family that runs hotels, went far beyond setting up the kitchen and the dining room, but he got involved with setting up the entirety of the hotel created the logo, created the rooms, decor the room decoration, the interior design, got very, very involved in setting up the hotel, unasked. At the end, he says, okay, I have an exclusive on the catering, but I also want to get paid for setting up the hotel because that wasn't part of the deal. The hotel owner says, I never hired you for that. That's number one. Not only I didn't hire you for it, and although I might have benefited from your work, but you didn't do it for me. You did it because you wanted the hotel to be successful, so therefore there'll be more guests, and if there are more guests, they'll, I'll have, you know, you'll have more business in the catering. So now you have a question as follows. He didn't hire him, so he doesn't have to pay him as a worker. But like we say, there's a concept in Jewish law called nene. And... You have to pay if you benefit someone. What happens if you benefit someone, but you are doing it for yourself? 
you weren't doing it for that person, is there a payment of nana? And in fact, in Chesha Mishpat, answer is no. Ribis, you know you're not allowed to charge interest without a heta iska or the like. So everyone knows I deal with, the, with Jews, or I only borrow from a non-Jewish bank. One of the biggest questions in London today, which I was working on today, is there's a bank called Metro Bank in England. The majority of its shareholders are non-Jewish, and therefore there's no issue of ribis. All of a sudden, a Jew came along and bought 53% of Metro Bank. With the purchase of this bank, he becomes the lender. Let's say every savings account, he becomes the borrower. Okay, so you say, empty out your savings accounts. Go to a different bank, no difference. The problem is as follows, that when he bought this bank, he became the owner of all loans, of all mortgages. The halacha is, if you borrow money from a non-Jew with interest, which is permissible, and then he sells the loan to a Jew, you're allowed to pay the Jew all interest that accrued before the sale. Anything after the sale, you're not allowed to pay. Now, what do a bunch of people have to do now when they have mortgages to Metro Bank? Metro Bank was just assumed by a Jewish person who's not religious, who doesn't care about the laws of Ribbis, and all of a sudden they owe lots of money to a Jew on interest, and to go borrow money from a different bank to pay it back, first of all, there are prepayment penalties. Number two, as everyone knows, interest rates have shot up, and these people have fixed rate mortgages that were taken some time ago. To be honest with you, I don't have the answer to this question yet. I was working on it this afternoon, and I sent it to my fellow Dayanim, and I said, this is a serious problem, and it's a communal problem. It's not like two people get into a dispute. This is a communal problem, and we have to come up with a communal solution. It's too easy to say, well, listen, you've got to borrow money and, at a high interest rate and pay it back, because it's going to, um, it will collapse too many people. I'll tell you one of the first cases I judged. Person, a Jewish person borrowed money from a <coughs> bank which is owned by non-religious Jews. He knew about that. And he said, I'm only going to borrow with a heta iska. It's beyond the parameters of today's shit to explain how a heta iska works. The bank sent him a heta iska. Very good. He signed it. He sent it back. He borrowed. One day, he starts thinking and says, you know something strange? They sent me a heta iska. I signed it, but they never signed it. And therefore it's binding on me, but it's not binding on them, and they're the ones who lent me the money. So he calls up the bank and says, you know, I don't recall you ever signing the Heta Iska. The bank says, you think we're crazy enough to sign a Heta Iska? You wanted one, we sent you one to make you feel good. But you should know, we never signed it, and we have no intention of signing it. starts thinking, wow, I borrowed five, fifty million dollars. It is ribis. In theory, you can get a loan from a different bank, but there's a 10% prepayment penalty. The 10% prepayment penalty, he'll have to take out of pocket five million dollars to avoid the Issa of ribis. And he came to me, I was sitting on a different peasant then. What do I do? I said, if I have to, I have to, but $5 million is going to pretty much sink my business. On the other hand, I realized that I was fooled, and I borrowed money from a Jewish person, Beribis, who did not sign the Heta Iska. I said, could I see the loan documents? He said, it's a waste of time. I looked through it already to see whether there's any reference in the loan documents that I had to Iska. And then if the bank signed the Heta Iska, the, the loan document, and it refers to a Heta Iska, that would bind them also. He says, I already did that. I said, send it to me anyway. 
sends, he brings it into me. He said, can I email it to you? No. I said, you cannot email it to me. You have to bring it to me. He says, why? He says, I'll tell you afterwards. Gets it, brings it to me. And I look at it. And there's a head to Iska, only signed by him, stapled to the back of the loan document. I said, who put in this staple? He says, the bank did. I said, you should know this staple is worth $5 million. In New York State law, where the loan took place, anything that is annexed to a loan document which is signed becomes part of that document, and the signing on the document will bind them to what they annexed. I said, if you would have stapled it together, it would be rivers, and you'd have to repay it, and you lost $5 million in a prepayment penalty. Because they stapled it, although they're wicked people, because they knew they were f- deliberately fooling you. They had you sign the Heta Isk, and they didn't sign it, and when, even when you called them up, they refused to acknowledge responsibility, but you have to know that because when they stapled it, they bound themselves to it, and therefore it is not ribbis. Excuse me, we can go on and on a whole night. But I want to now tell you why most Dine Terror happen, and then how to avoid it. I find one of three things. Most people do not, are not con men or fraudsters. So why do they get into disputes? I find many, many nice people coming in front of me in <coughs> disputes. Sometimes they're bit, bitter disputes, the family disputes. And it's one of three things, mainly by partnerships. One, they go into a partnership without making clear or writing down what are the terms of the partnership. They think, ah, we're such good friends, we're brothers and sisters, we're family, and what do we have to write it down? We work together, we trust each other. Biggest mistake in the world. Where family is the worst. I don't know if they speak too much Yiddish here, but in Yiddish there's an expression, mit mishpacha estman kegel. With family, you should eat potato kugel, but do business with someone else. Do business with strangers. With family, you should eat Shabbos meals. But sometimes it's unavoidable. And with friends also, make sure you have everything documented and everything written. Because then you don't have fights later. I once told two people who are planning a business together, you have two options. You can treat each other like friends now, and then you'll be screaming Ganav at each other in a few years. Or you could treat each other like Ganavim now, and then you'll be friends in a few years. This is your choice. But you can't have both. Next is, many people, they write all the agreements, everything, exactly what was agreed. But they forget one thing, that partnerships don't last forever. Partnerships don't last forever. And sometimes you want to get out of a partnership. And that's all right. But if you don't write down before what is the mechanism for getting out of a partnership or getting out of a situation, you're going to get into a dispute later. Because invariably, people, their life changes, their circumstances change, and they have to get out. And you didn't agree on how to get out, and then you have a dispute how to get out. You had a beautiful partnership, which then breaks up. And now I want to tell you one more thing. I was doing a case, D versus T, these were two people that were good friends, very good friends. They went into a partnership together, very, very successful together. They were very close. When I say close, is when each one made a chasana, uh, made a wedding. They made sheva brachas for each other. They weren't just business partners. They became friends. And unfortunately, they had a difference of opinions and they wound up in a dentera. They wind up in the dentera. These former friends are hurling heinous accusations at each other. This one's screaming Shakran, this one's screaming Ganev, this one's screaming, they're screaming at each other. Now the truth is, truth be told, as a Dayan, I'm supposed to remain impassive, just listen to the arguments and decide them on their merits. But you should know, for over 25 years before I was a full-time dying, I was a Rav. And as a Rav, I, I, I used to make peace. 
and sometimes the old Rav pops out of me. And I said, I want to stop the Dintera right now. And I said, I used to be a Rav before I was an Avbezin. The old Rav wants to give a speech right now. And I said, let me tell you something. You are screaming Ganev, you are screaming Shakram. You are not a Ganev and you are not a Shakram. What's the problem over here? You, T, are an older person who went in this business for capital appreciation to one day leave an inheritance to your family. You, D, are a young person with a young family and you went into the business for income. Two people can have a business, be the best of friends, have everything written down, but if they have totally different objectives in the first place, eventually you're going to get up in a dispute. And I asked the question, so how did the partnership last eight years? So I'll tell you why. Because you're Taka, such good friends, and you're not a Shakran and you're not a Ganav. Because otherwise it would have busted after a year. It lasted because you're good friends and you were looking out for each other. But ultimately, if you enter a partnership and you have totally different objectives, it cannot last. And I said, <clears throat> I'm changing from my Rav back to being a Dayan. Now that we clarified this, we're just going to break up the partnership in an amicable manner. And once we did this, within a half hour, it was taken care of. And that's my final piece of advice. A, get everything written down. Get, how do you get out of this partnership? But most importantly, you should have a mission statement. Besides the terms of the partnership, you should have a mission statement at the beginning, what you both agree with. Because if you both won't agree on what the purpose is, eventually you're going to have to get into a dispute. And therefore, the only advice I could give you, if you don't want to sit in front of me and hear, the only um, thing you could do is have everything in writing, figure out how to get out of it, and make sure that you're on the same page for why you are doing this partnership, why you're engaging in this business, not just the what, because the, in life, the why is as important as the what. The Ratzin, in this schus, we try to hear what is the correct way to run a business, what is the correct way to avoid disputes, we should all merit Shalom, Bracha, and Atzlacha. Good night. Amen. Amen. Shemeri, <laughs> <laughs>